Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to switch gears a little bit and talk about some female urethral stricture disease. So female urethral stricture is you know, pretty rare. A lot of us think of stricture disease as being a disease of the male urethra. However, there is emergent evidence that this is something that occurs quite frequently in women and is, uh, and is often underdiagnosed and often underrecognized. Uh, so in terms of definitions, um, it's basically the inability to pass a 14 French catheter uh, through the urethral lumen due to scarring. Um, however, not all females that have urethral strictures need to be treated. Um, if, the, if their presentation coincides with lower urinary tract symptoms, then you want to consider treatment. Uh, so let's just briefly talk about the female urethra and how it uh, differentiates itself from the male urethra. So the female urethra has three anatomic regions. Um, in the distal part of the urethra um, is the distal urethra, which is the one, last one-third of the urethral length. Uh, the middle urethra uh, houses the sphincter mechanism for women. And then the proximal one-third includes the bladder neck. Uh, similar to the male urethra, there is a transition in the histology type. Uh, so from the distal aspect, you have more st um, stratified squamous epithelium, and then more proximally, you have um, urethelial epithelium. So what causes female urethral strictures? Uh, the question is hard to answer. Uh, by and large, we think that we don't know a reason for it. So more than 51% of cases are idiopathic. Um, and then the large chunk of uh, strictures are actually caused by us. Uh, so when we catheterize women, when they undergo radiation therapy, and when they undergo vaginal urethral surgeries, we are setting up for future risk of urethral uh, strictures. About 10% of patients will have stricture disease from trauma. Uh, in the Western world, that could be pelvic fracture-related uh, trauma. Um, and in more developing countries, you can have urethral stricture develop after obstructed labor. In our older patients, it's important to also examine uh, the vagina as well, uh, because as women go through menopause, vaginal atrophy can be an independent risk factor for urethral stricture disease. A lot of women also have inflammatory disease conditions, such as lichen sclerosis. Uh, this is very similar to uh, balanitis uh, xerotica um, <clears throat> obliterans in men um, and can also cause urethral stricture disease. Uh, so how do women present? Um, unfortunately, it's very hard to kind of differentiate um, uh, urethral stricture disease from other causes of bladder outlet obstruction. So a lot of women will present with dysuria, with pain, uh, with frequency and urgency and incontinence. And as urologists, we know that these overlap with a lot of other conditions that we treat. In terms of the differential, it's quite broad. Uh, so women can have bladder outlet obstruction from pelvic organ prolapse, from vaginal masses, um, from even from void and dysfunction. So the onus really relies on uh, the onus really uh, lies in us to kind of carefully, you know, uh, roll this out and have a high index of suspicion for urethral stricture disease. Uh, one study showed that about five percent of women who presented to tertiary care centers actually had urethral stricture disease, and another study showed that more than ten percent of women who have bladder outlet obstruction also have urethral stricture disease. Uh, so how do we examine the woman when she comes into our office? Uh, you want to look at the external genitalia. Uh, you want to see, you know, is the vagina atrophic in appearance uh, because that might affect how you reconstruct her. Um, if she has atrophy or she's perimenopausal or menopausal, you want to start her in vaginal estrogen. Uh, you also want to look for porcelainous changes, uh, which are identified up here. Uh, in the vulva area, and then also in the perineal area. That's pathognomonic for lichen sclerosis. Um, and then you also want to rule out any kind of urethral uh, lesions. So on the bottom left here is a Skeen's gland cyst, and the bottom right is urethral prolapse. How do we diagnose urethral strictures? Again, it's not really clear. There's not any kind of consensus about how to do that. Um, so a lot of this is based on expert opinion. Um, so obviously, cystoscopy is a big part of our armamentarium as urologists. Um, in my practice, I typically uh, do a flexible pediatric cystoscope. In the OR, you can do a semi-rigid ureteroscope. Um, cystoscopy basically helps us uh, identify whether a stricture is present or not. Um, however, it won't tell us how long the stricture is. In the olden days, we, uh, <clears throat> there was talk about doing retrograde urethrograms. However, in the female urethra, which is quite short, um, it's hard to do that in any kind of degree of success. Uh, but by and large, what I tend to do is do VCUG. Um, on a VCUG, you'll see the pathognomonic wine glass deformity, which you see here, um, which will show us not only the location of the stricture, but how long it is. 
Uh, the VCUG is also very helpful because it helps you see if there's any kind of bladder morphologic changes that might help you counsel the patient. Furthermore, you can get a Euroflow test uh, to see if there are any kind of dynamics um, that might affect how the woman voids. You can also see if there's retention as well because that can help with counseling. Uh, in my practice, I combine these two studies, so a Euroflow and a VCG, by doing video urodynamics. Um, you can do it through a suprapubic tube or a small, tiny urethral catheter. And urodynamics is helpful because it can help you see if the bladder is still functional um, and help you counsel the patient accordingly. And it can also help you know if there is any kind of stress incontinence which might uh, require a second procedure. Now, in the literature for male urethrostrictor disease, there's a lot of talk about urethral rest. Uh, the consensus in the female stricter disease uh, uh, population is not clear. Uh, that's partly because we have less cases, we have less data, uh, but most of us will wait at least three months after a formal dilation to proceed with a formal repair. Superpubic tubes can be helpful, especially if a woman has already been in retention or she has imminent retention, and can also help to um, <clears throat> propagate the urethral rest as well. Um, how do we manage this non-surgically? Um, in my practice, I put all women on vaginal estrogen. Uh, this is really important because it helps with wound healing. It helps with making the vaginal epithelium more robust um, in terms of restoring integrity and blood flow to the vagina. For women who have lichen sclerosis, um, there's evidence that corticosteroid therapy can help to kind of rejuvenate the, the vulva and get a good response. For women who fail that, you can do photodynamic therapy or tacrolimus uh, to help to slow down inflammation. Now, the data in the, vulva, uh, uh, in the lichen sclerosis um, literature is not clear as to whether uh, starting patients on corticosteroid therapy or tacrolimus, um, whether that will benefit the urethra. We know that the vulva responds to these therapies, but we don't know if that helps to reverse any kind of urethral stricture disease. Uh, in terms of management, uh, similar to the male uh, strict uh, literature, uh, endoscopic management is always an acceptable first-line option. Um, several studies have shown that if you dilate a woman's urethra, uh, there is some success at three years. Uh, so about 40% of uh, those patients will have some success in reduced symptoms. But similarly, we see that with repeated endoscopic procedures, you do have uh, diminishing returns in terms of success. Uh, DVIUs are not typically recommended in this population because, again, the urethra in the female is much shorter, and you can damage the urinary sphincter and cause incident SUI, uh, so we tend, by and large, not to do that. With the introduction of Optilum, um, this uh, brings some more exciting options for women who have urethrostricture disease. Um, again, there's no data in this realm. Um, however, there was a case report published about a year ago and a woman who had a complex urethral stricture, and at six months they found that they had some success in terms of her symptoms. Um, obviously there is no long-term data, um, but this could be an option for a well-selected patient who's either, who's either risk averse in terms of reconstructive options or has other comorbidities. Uh, so when we reconstruct women, what are the considerations that we should think about? Um, so the data would show that only about 3% of women who have strictures actually ever get reconstructed or repaired compared to 10% of male strictures. But similarly, we want to think about you know, what their prior treatment is, uh, how they responded to it, uh, what the stricture location is, how long it is. Um, is there any kind of incontinence that's occurring at the same time? Because that would determine whether, what other treatments you have to offer. And then sexual function, because we use a lot of local vaginal flops. Uh, so now I'll just talk briefly about some of the options uh, for reconstructing women. Uh, there are many different described techniques. Um, they're quite heterogeneous, uh, but generally we define them by a uh, region of urethra that's involved. So for more distal strictures, you can consider a distal urethrectomy and advancement meatoplasty, similar to what we do with men with uh, 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 meatal strictures. Um, this has a success rate of more than 90%. Um, however, you must counsel women that they can generate a hypospadiac meatus, and they might have vaginal voiding afterwards. Um, any urologist can do this, it's quite simple. Uh, sim basically what you do is make a circumscribed incision around the urethra, you harvest vaginal uh, flops uh, circumferentially, and then you kind of excise the disease segment and um, reapproximate healthy urethral mucosa to the vaginal flops you've developed. Uh, for longer distal urethral strictures, uh, this is when you start getting into the flaps 
um, and there are many different flops that are um, open as choices. Uh, one of the more commonly popularized ones is the, bl the blandy flap urethroplasty. Uh, this is good for strictures that are distal, but also span the mid-urethra. And basically what you do is you make a horseshoe incision on the vaginal wall. Uh, you basically develop a flap um, on the proximal kind of vaginal mucosa. Um, and then you make your stricturotomy in the, on the ventral aspect of the urethra, and then you swing over your flap and tack it down. Um, the success, again, for these are more than 80%, um, but you do risk that the woman will, vag will void through the vagina because you're having kind of a, a different neomeatus. Um, on the right is a labial flap urethroplasty. So, for instance, for a woman who has vaginal scarring or short anterior vaginal wall, you might want to consider using her labia minora. And same idea, you, you harvest a segment of labia minora, you make a stricturotomy, and then you flop it over. Uh, for mid-urethral strictures, there are many more vaginal flaps, some of which I'll present, as well as a buccal graft uh, urethroplasty. Um, this is equally as effective as a vaginal flap. Um, there are nuances as to when you choose one versus the other, but generally speaking, you want to avoid vaginal flaps in women who have atrophy or lichen sclerosis. Um, and data would suggest that buccal mucosal grafts are actually equally as effective. Uh, in terms of the success rate, um, it's about 80 to 90% successful. Um, because it is in the mid-urethra, you might injure that sphincter mechanism. Um, so you have to counsel women about developing stress incontinence afterwards. Uh, complications include restricture, uh, flop necrosis, and vaginal shortening, which can cause sexual dysfunction. Um, so one popular option is a U-shaped flap urethroplasty. Uh, you're simply harvesting you know, the anterior vaginal wall. Um, you're basically mobilizing it, swinging it over, and creating a neomeatus out of the, the vaginal uh, epithelium. Um, and then you're closing that over the urethra. And this is a lateral flap uh, urethroplasty. Uh, here you have a midline incision. Uh, you're making a ventral stricturotomy. Um, and then you're swinging over a lateral flap of vag a vaginal uh, epithelium and then creating a new tube from that and then closing the vagina. Um, here is another uh, procedure that's been well described. Um, it could be used for both mid urethral strictures as well as proximal urethral strictures. Um, this is especially for women who have very kind of short, um, healthy uh, um, urethral uh, segments after you excise um, a diseased urethral segment. Basically what you do is harvest labia minora, you tubularize it, and then you anastomose it uh, primarily to the healthy urethral end. Uh, the problem, however, with these is that you, know, you can get graft uh, saculation, um, you can get issues with the neomeatus, um, but it is an option for women uh, um, who have had prior reconstruction. Uh, this is my favorite, this is dorsal onlay urethroplasty, uh, which is quite familiar to us from the male literature. Simply here, what we do is uh, do a stricturotomy either on the dorsal aspect of the urethra or in the ventral aspect. Um, you harvest buccal graft and then you tack it down to um, the, the urethral lumen and it's almost as, as if you've never been there before. For proximal strictures, um, again, the buccal graft urethroplasty is kind of the mainstay. Uh, for salvage cases, you can close the bladder neck, which is quite morbid for a lot of patients. And then in the pediatric literature, um, it's been described to use a bladder flap similar to a YV plasty. Um, um, however, this requires a retropubic approach. In terms of success, we know that dorsal uh, urethroplasty is basically equivalent to ventral urethroplasty in the male literature. There have been several studies that look at this in the female uh, uh, stricter space, and we think that the success rates are equal. Um, there are nuances as to why you choose one versus the other. Uh, for the dorsal approach, um, you do get additional blood supply from the clitoral bed, um, and you can get fixation against the pubic bone that will help your graft stay in place and not saculate. Um, however, because you're so close to the clitoral bodies, you do risk sexual dysfunction, and then you're operating under the pubic bone, so it's kind of no man's land. Um, so, but you know, this kind of works quite well. Um, it can be an effective source of control for women. Uh, in terms of the ventral approach, you do risk urethrovaginal fistula, but a lot of, peop a lot of um, providers have discussed using a Marius fat pad to kind of um, mitigate that uh, risk. Um, and also, you can injure the sphincter mechanism and cause stress incontinence, 
but because of your approach, you can also put in a um, sling at the same time and um, help to treat that. Uh, so what happens with post-operative management? Uh, typically, it's a catheter for one to three weeks. If it's a meatal stricture, typically just three days. Um, in this space, the role of VCUG post-operatively is not clear, uh, simply because with vaginal flaps, uh, we are changing the meatal configuration. A lot of women will void into the vagina afterwards. Uh, so VCUG has less um, kind of diagnostic um, uh, utility in this space. Uh, so what are long-term data in terms of the outcomes? Again, it's a rare uh, clinical entity in terms of both diagnosis as well as actually formal repair. Um, but there was a multi-institutional study that was published two years ago, um, uh, which looked at over 200 women who underwent uh, treatment for stricture, and they found that the recurrence rate was about 35% for all comers, and the risk of stress incontinence is about 5%. Uh, when they looked at uh, freedom from stricture, they found that um, the population in the blue, which was endoscopic management, had a 41% uh, uh, freedom from stricture rate. Um, and when they compare that to patients who underwent to local flops versus buccal grafts, they found that that rate went up to 70 and 61%. Um, when you compare uh, local flops compared to buccal mucosal graft, um, they seem to have about equivalent success. Um, but again, this is kind of upcoming and emerging data, and hopefully there'll be more to come. So in conclusion, female youth restrictor disease is quite rare. Um, there's a lot of underdiagnosis because this is not something that we think about quite commonly. Um, however, uh, prior literature has shown that this is something that occurs quite frequently, especially in tertiary care centers. For any woman that has obstructive symptoms, you want to think about whether she has a stricter or not. Um, similar to male and stricter uh, literature, we want to figure out where the stricture is, how long it is, what's been done before, and what the surrounding tissue looks like before we um, offer advice about treatment. And then finally, there's no real form formal consensus about what, best, what is best to do for these patients. Uh, we know that endoscopic management is a reasonable first approach. Um, however, when you do it repeatedly, less likely to work. Uh, when in doubt, it's best to refer to a reconstructive specialist or use a technique that you're familiar with. And with that, I'll take questions. <laughs>